Hello, friends. Um, welcome to the 2017 Global Dialogue on Waste. Um, since 2013, we've been making uh, high quality knowledge easily accessible and consumable to leaders anywhere in the world. And um, for us, the qualification to be a leader um, was anyone being able to take a step towards finding solutions to and through waste. And um, for us, a leader doesn't have to be someone with a leadership position, but anywhere, uh, anyone, anywhere in the world belonging to any community and at any point in their lives and professions uh, can be a leader. No single community or person has a monopoly on leadership and all you need to be, um, all you need is to be able to wish to make change. Um, if not for our work, most of this information would have uh, stayed immobilized or landfilled and lengthy PDFs or uh, would have been expensive international conferences. So um, we are extremely happy about the impact we've been creating, but um, this is just a drop in the ocean compared uh, to the scale of challenges we face, which are all planetary. We have our uh, battles to fight. We will have uh, many heroes, successes, and failures. So I request you to get ready to lead and take the next step towards improving life on our precious pale blue dot. For those who are not ready yet, um, take your time. And uh, when you're ready, we'll be here to help and guide you take the next step. And I'll be here to help in any other way possible. Um, in addition to the global dialogue on waste, Be Waste Wise also uh, publishes uh, uh, a waste pioneers list. Uh, it's a list of uh, 30 organizations and 30 individuals worldwide who are doing uh, an amazing job of sharing their story or sharing solutions using social media. And once the list is published, we also organize Q&A sessions with the pioneers. And we're also planning an interview series, a weekly interview series with individual pioneers. So uh, check them out, um, follow us on um, social media, and also uh, subscribe to our monthly newsletter to stay updated. In addition to all of this, we also have a community newsletter. So if you've ever been a contributor to Be Waste Wise, uh, or if you've been an author or um, panelist on Be Waste Wise, you could send your um, uh, updates, your work achievements, or uh, any new articles that you've written to Be Waste Wise, and then we will share them uh, with our community on the newsletter and also on our social media. Um, and uh, this year we have about uh, 330 registrations for this event. So I'm really happy and about this and th thank you for your support. Um, greatly appreciate it. And uh, finally, um, um, I've been um, actively seeking employment. And while I was doing that, I realized that there is no single platform or um, single place on the internet for uh, people in waste management sector to find good jobs. Um, so, uh, you know, um, just another drop in the ocean, but uh, we will be uh, putting together uh, jobs from around the world and uh, posting them on our LinkedIn group and also on our uh, social media um, channels. So if you have any uh, job opportunities with you, send it to us. You can find, you know, access to better talent. You can get access to better talent and everyone else will have a place to go to when, when they need, uh, when they're in search of jobs. Um, and in today's theme, we'll discuss, uh, coming to today's theme, collective action. We will discuss how uh, all of us can act collectively to address the planetary scale challenges we face today. Um, uh, they can only, I mean, these challenges are planetary, but the solutions are all local. So they cannot be um, solved by one organization or one person doing something. All of us have to act collectively, take a step forward um, and um, towards a common goal. So um, to, to uh, discuss all of this, uh, first we have uh, uh, Olivia Lapierre and uh, Chanel Crosby. Uh, both of them are ambassadors at uh, B0 and uh, they'll be talking about uh, why or and or how we can make environmental movements more inclusive and diverse so that we can act collectively. Then we have uh, another Olivia and Carter Rice, uh, co-founders of uh, One More Generation, talk about how they engage public with their campaigns. And then uh, Madison Gitlin from Global Green will talk about their ambassador program to engage apartment buildings in recycling. And then we have uh, Chris Kane from Post Landfill Action Network. Uh, he'll take us through their manual for plastic-free campuses. And finally, we have Marcus Erickson talk about his book, Junkraft, uh, uh, Ocean Voyage and a 
uh, Rising Tide of Activism Against Plastic Pollution. That's the name of the book. Uh, about the book and he'll also tell us about his experiences from bali indonesia where he currently is for a uh, global meeting um first let's start with um olivia and um, chanel chanel uh, is unable to join us through video but we have her on our audio stream and uh, we also have uh, olivia here um olivia and chanel welcome to the 2017 global dialogue hi thank you hi thank you Thanks, great. So, um, Olivia, could you uh, um, tell us a little bit about um, how you got involved in this movement and, you know, why you think um, environmental movements are not more diverse? Yeah, um, so uh, I got involved in the zero waste movement uh, because my partner stumbled upon some zero waste bloggers online and then shared it with me because um, he knew I had been really engaged in climate activism within our community. Uh, and he thought that this would, uh, and basically he thought this would be a cool project for us to do. And so I tried it out. Um, I mean, not tried it out, but like I'm still doing it. And um, I really enjoyed living zero waste. Um, it's so different from other climate activism um, for me because it feels that I'm not like, for me, I was just like harassing people to like reduce their trash and um, and their plastic intake, but not really doing anything in my life. So it, it's holding me more accountable in the things that I'm um, projecting out in the world as far as climate activism. Um, and I think, I mean, there's several reasons why. I, I, I think it's not a lack of... I think it's both a lack of people of color in climate activism, but also a lack of recognition for the people that are in climate activism um, for several reasons, white supremacy, systemic racism, institutionalized racism, structural racism. Um, and um, it's not really focusing, it's not really about their capacity to be professionals or activists within these spaces, um, but not having a sense of belonging. Right. Um, Chanel, um, could you respond to the same question? You know, how did you get involved and um, why do you think that there aren't more uh, people of color in um, environmental movements and uh, wh why you think uh, it's not more diverse? Sure. Um, so I, I came into the zero waste world um, through meeting Andrea, the founder of B Zero, a couple years ago. And um, we met and just started talking about kind of having too much stuff and things like that. So I didn't approach it directly into zero waste. Zero waste was sort of an evolving practice for me. So I was downsizing stuff and then I started to think about how I was eating. So that changed how I was grocery shopping. And so I started to stay to the outside of the store and then realized that things are wrapped in plastic more so towards the middle and of the grocery store. And so having those conversations with Andrea really shed light on what a zero waste economy is for me, is in general, and how I could participate in reducing my own personal plastic consumption. And from there, um, learning more and getting more involved in the zero waste industry and seeing that there is a lack of representation and um, why there's a lack of representation, I think, what Olivia said is is fantastic and spot on. So I I don't want to overlap that and, and also just highlight the fact that I think it's representation would be one of the hugest pieces. And so the representation ongoing and um, the decentralization of the current structures and support in that way. So I, we see people of color and what they've been doing for years and support that. All right. Um... All right, so um, when um, the two of you um, talk about the subject to someone new, um, what are some initial reactions or frequently asked questions? And um, how do you generally respond to them? Can you give us some examples on what kind of questions or responses you get? Um, either one of you can go first. Um, one that I typically hear often is like people saying, um, I could never do this because of like X, Y, and Z. I have a busy life. I have two jobs and kids, or um, I just have a lot going on, various reasons. Um, to which I respond, um, you know, like encouraging them. It's like just about being intentional, being aware, rather than trying to be perfect. 
about this um, and really trying to stay away from terms like zero waste and um, and highlight on terms like low waste. So like, um, yeah. And then because often I think zero waste is um, mis leading because it's not talking about producing no waste but referring to that industrial term um, in addition to I tried to never give any unsolicited advice to those people um, and really let wait for them to take um, leader like to be the leader of that conversation and so if they ask questions um, I respond in the most empathetic way in which like I'm recognizing that different forms of oppression um, might be the reason why um, they're not able to be as engaged in climate activism. Mm -hmm. um, Chanel, uh, do you um, get similar questions and um, do you have similar experiences? Yes, absolutely. I think a lot of it, um, when you first step into it, whatever your exposure is, whether it's social media or another form of introduction, it can feel overwhelming as we apply zero waste, especially because it can make people who are just getting started or um, feel like they're not doing enough ever. And so um, similar to Olivia, if, if people ask me, then I, I love to share just small things that you can take for first steps, like reducing plastic bag use, um, refusing straws, and um, bringing around a reusable cup. And so a lot of times like that reusable cup can be an old salsa jar, for example, that you rinse out and now you have a jar and you already had that product in your shelf and didn't realize that it could also be used for something else later. So really just kind, kind of building that awareness and seeing how we can repurpose what we have, like what we already have access to and starting with that really simply. And um, since you're talking about um, repurposing what we have, um, uh, in our test run, we discussed this a little bit um, about how um, these days um, being zero waste or um, being in the circular economy means um, you buy new stuff to replace the old stuff. Um, so could you talk about that uh, on how th that probably is not zero waste? Sure. Yes, of course. And so um, through that process, if we if we see, you know, people that have been living a zero waste lifestyle for a long time and they have access to all the jars that they've collected maybe incrementally over shorter periods or maybe they did have a lot of money that they wanted to invest up front and they they completely overhauled say the kitchen or the bathroom at once well we like to talk about how that's that's not as supportive because then you're throwing away what you already had access to and then just replacing it so in that process of becoming closer to a zero waste or trash light living then you're actually creating more waste and so um like encouraging people if you have your favorite toothpaste right now but it happens to come in plastic but you have a whole tube you know this is a really small example you just finishing the tube and then and then looking into maybe making your own toothpaste later after that or other options. But um, but really that's that incremental small, it's, you know, I like to think of it as a marathon, not a sprint. Okay. And um, Olivia, could you um, tell us, uh, I mean, uh, we, uh, the three of us got in touch um, through the Loma article um, that, that you've written. Um, and I hear that you've uh, gotten really good um, response to it. So congratulations on that. And um, so could you talk a little bit about the difference between environmental racism, gentrification, and the zero waste movement? I mean, this is something that you mentioned in the article. But uh, before you do that, let me just um, remind our viewers that um, so we have um, Chanel Crosby and Olivia Lapierre with us today uh, from B0. And um, if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to be answered, uh, please use the Q&A box below the um, screen. You can use it to submit the question and then, you know, depending on how many questions we have, we have about uh, at least 15 minutes for the uh, panelists to respond. So, yeah, Olivia, could you tell us a little bit about the difference between those three, uh, racism, environmental racism, gentrification, and the zero waste movement? Um, yeah, I think there's, I mean, when I think of those three things, I don't think of, like, any differences. I see them all being so totally connected. Um, when I think gentrification, I'm thinking of um, communities um, that of color, um, housing costs rising because of various reasons. And recently I've been doing some research on how um, urban agriculture and different sustainability 
initiatives coming into communities of color um, and cleaning those cleaning those communities up um, has been pushing the people of color or um, lower income people out of their neighborhoods. Um, in addition to, I think about how um, sustainability has as a whole been gentrified in which, um, again, we're talking about like this buy-in culture um, and that excludes lower income people and a variety of other people um, into the conversation. And so basically um, giving the message that like, if you're poor, if you're a person of color or um, other identity or marginalized in some way, that you don't deserve to live in safe neighborhoods, that you can't afford to live in safe neighborhoods, that those aren't, they're not making them clean or safe for you. Um, I just wanna pull up this quote from Wear Your Voice Mags, that uh, Wear Your Voice Mag, which is an intersectional feminist magazine based out of Oakland, um, in which they define environmental racism so beautifully. Um, so environmental racism is the disproportionate impact of environmental hazards of people of color. The air we breathe, the water we drink, even the neighborhoods we end up living in, um, living in are controlled by policies and practices. Redlining and housing discrimination of the 21st, 20th century is responsible for segregating people of color into the least desirable neighborhoods. 50% of people who live near hazardous waste are people of color. And flood, uh, flood plains throughout the country have a high black and Latinx population. Additionally, black children are twice as like, likely to suffer from lead poisoning as white children. And a big example of that is like Flint, um, Flint water crisis. So I'm like thinking, I, I think of like policies and structures um, uh, for that prohibit people of color from, you know, living in safe neighborhoods, but also, um, you know, not making them feel like they have a space to um, do anything about it. Right. And um, Chanel, so um, these impacts um, for someone like me who hasn't been, um, who, who's not uh, very involved or, or do not know much about um, environmental racism, um, it, it feels like, um, from my perspective, it feels like it's a combination of poverty and um, racism uh, that, you know, we have these kind of impacts on um, people of color. Um, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, am I right to think about it that way? Or, you know, what else should I know about? Yes, definitely. Um, I mean, I see them, I see the environmental racism, gentrification, and, and zero waste movement as a solution. It's all intersectional to me as well. And, um, and really being able to draw those lines between, so now, now I feel like with gentrification, we're experiencing the reverse of white flight. And so we're seeing people from the suburban areas come into urban areas where it's closer to things like light rails and jobs in downtown. And so they're tearing down older structures and smaller homes and replacing them with condos to absorb that influx of people from suburban areas. And so, um, so we saw, you know, we saw that a few, you know, what, a couple, 20, 30 years ago, and now we're seeing the reverse of that now. So there's more, even more uprooting happening and, and displacement. And so seeing that the zero waste movement as a solution for these things um, with representation of communities of color to offset and, and, um, you know, support resolution for those environmental hazards and shutting them down um, providing safer, healthier neighborhoods and places to live. And the awareness, I think, is key. Um, so um, I don't um, completely understand, you know, the connection between zero waste movement and maybe gentrification. Mm. Um, they do seem like um, quite different topics to me. So uh, how do you form the connection? Um, uh, how they connected? Sure. Yeah, I think that... Um, as we see, um, we'll use the condo example just because it's it's the biggest. And I think that as I've been traveling, I've seen it in a lot of different cities. Uh -huh. And so, for example, um, tearing down structures in place and displacing people. So thinking about the zero waste perspective, not just from plastic consumption and the reduction of that, but also from a holistic approach, thinking of people. And so we don't want to we don't want to like 
waste, quote unquote, people. And so what we're doing instead of supporting and, and providing resources to those in place communities and structures is displacing them. So there's there's a waste there. But then there's also the environmental racism and the and the things that we know about those communities um, and then the environmental lack of support that's given there. So so I see those two opportunities as a way to support. So an example of that um, would be like pipelines, landfills, incinerators, things like that. Um, so with the environmental racism work. And so the condos are an example of the superficial, like what we can see happening with gentrification, the visual of it. And then I think underneath that is the environmental racism and the systemic things that happen to displace people and and provide support and healthy living for certain you know, it's class as well. So um, really seeing the zero waste movement as a way for us to open up these conversations and make the environmental justice work, the climate justice work, and the zero waste work all intersectional and and connected. So that way we have more strength in, in campaigns and movements. And um, I think that they would be more successful that way. Right. I'd also like to add um, a lot of the leaders of the zero waste movement um, are living in highly gentrified neighborhoods like Brooklyn, um, which begs the question, who has accessibility and resources to be even able to be in this, um, to, to be a participant within this movement? So like I can't connect with someone who's living in a very gentrified neighborhood, like for example, Brooklyn, because like that's just not like, I could never afford to live there. I don't have those resources in my community. Um, it makes me feel like only people within those gentrified areas um, are able to participate in um, in uh, sustainable uh, sustainability initiatives, which already feel like a very gentrified, um, whatever movement it may be within that realm, feel gentrified anyways. Yes. Right. And um, this was a conversation uh, we were having um, earlier this year with um, um, Julie Kearns from uh, Shop Junket. Uh, she's from Minneapolis and um, she runs a zero waste store. And um, this was a similar conversation. So um, we were asking about how what she thinks about being, you know, zero waste in a community which is, um, uh, you know, which is high income. Uh, in Minneapolis, you know, living on the river, uh, on the riverside, and um, uh, so it's it, 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 that's a good conversation that we've had earlier on a similar topic. So I would, um, you know, recommend um, viewers to um, look for the 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 interview with uh, Julie Kearns um, and um, get more more knowledge about the subject. Um, so um, Olivia, and uh, going back to the article again, the article that you wrote. Um, in, in, in that article, you say, uh, you say that the current zero waste or circular economy movements are extreme, elitist, and superficial. So, you know, what do you mean by that? And uh, if they are not ideal, what's your, what's your vision for the future of our world? That the, oh, that the zero waste or circular economy movements are extreme. Um, again, like uh, resources are not made accessible um, to um, lower income people, to people of color. So, for example, um, the zero waste stores being in gentrified neighborhoods um, and which and then selling products that um, that are ex extremely expensive. So, like, for example, when I first started zero waste, I like bought that very um like stereotypical zero waste kit with the tiffin and all of the like the bamboo utensils and whatnot and that was like over it was like a hundred something dollars just to be able to be um to feel confident and that I belonged within this movement um that I needed those tools um in addition to I think not talking about give us some um, examples Olivia can you give uh, us some examples so that you know we understand what you're talking about like what kind of tools or what did you okay. have to do? Yeah, like um, for example, like stainless steel tiffins, which cost about $25, um, bamboo utensils, um, um, like hemp, um, uh, what's it called? 
um, shower curtains, which cost about $90, um, mason jars, um, uh, yeah, a variety of products like that. They're all extremely expensive. Oh, clean canteen water bottles. And not to say that they're not going to make from really great companies and we should support them, but like when we're making those the only faces of what the zero waste movement is about, then it's not allowing other people to, you know, think that like, oh, I could just, you know, use utensils from home and bring them with me. I have to buy in to this culture and I need to go buy bamboo utensils because that's what I'm seeing. Um, in addition to, I think, one um, – one uh, thing that the zero waste movement and I see a lot of environmental movements lacking is bringing um, awareness to the systemic oppression, um, specifically systemic racism um, that people of color are facing. So, for example, like when Charlottesville happened, like trying to get people within environmental communities to talk about that instead of ignoring um, the systemic oppression that people of color are facing. And so when you're not acknowledging that, like, people of color are, um, are being oppressed, whether it's mass incarceration, prison, uh, school-to-prison pipeline, uh, police brutality, environmental racism, the list goes on and on, um, then you're already making them feel like, oh, you're not recognizing my oppression. How could I ever feel like I belong within this movement? Um, also not highlighting um, people of color who are involved in sustainability work um, and by not giving them a platform, uh, you're participating um, with it, participating in the lack of representation of POCs within um, environmental communities. And this is as simple as like following people of color. Um, like when I first started Zero Waste, like a lot of the people I was following were not following any people of color which was bizarre to me because like, it wasn't that people of color aren't doing this stuff, um, but you're just not following them. Right. Um, and then, um, yeah, so. All right. Huh? All right. Um, so um, uh, this is um, a question that um, we discussed um, during our um, test run, which was that, uh, you know, uh, Be Waste Wise uh, um, cares about representation and we've looked, uh, you know, every time we do look for, you know, diverse voices. And if you look at our um, history, you, you'll be able to see that um, female panelists um, have been like really close to 50%, you know, which is not boasting, which is not ideal. But then I think it's pretty um, high when compared to other platforms where, you know, people get a chance to speak. So uh, we do care about diversity, but um, it's also difficult um, to um, find people of color, you know, um, talking about these issues. I mean, we, we've discussed this during the test run. And um, so what kind of suggestions do you have, you know, for, for an organization like this? So I think we can get to that after Chanel responds to, uh, you know, um, what, uh, how she thinks um, the current zero waste movement and circular economy movement are superficial, elitist, or um, extreme. Can you, can you tell us what you think about that? Sure. Um, for, for the, so superficial elitist and extreme. Um, so with the superficiality that I'm referring to in that conversation is, is, um, what, what we see on Instagram, for example, is throwing, throwing the zero waste in front of anything else that you're doing. So zero waste dinner, zero waste shopping, zero waste clothes, zero waste beer, zero waste water. And so, um, which is good to generate support for the movement in general. But what I would love to see is us to talk about what does the term zero waste mean? Um, what does that mean for us as a people? What does that mean for people of color? What does that mean? You know, there's a deeper sort of motivation and intention that could be found and used as <coughs> like what Olivia is talking about in referencing um, current social times using this as a platform to do that and so um so the superficiality of it is sort of the trend that i'm seeing lately to to go zero waste but also to do it for appearances so that 
things look beautiful, um, which they do, but, but to see like what's underneath that, like, why am I actually participating in this? Because it takes a lot of energy and a lot of effort to participate in a trash light way of living in a linear economy where you're often met with resistance. So you're already practicing that resistance. So I think that it's, it would be beautiful if we could expand that, that resistance in order to, um, dismantle oppressive systems and, and, um, including representation as part of that. So that's where I see the superficiality come from. And the elitist aspect, um, which we've referenced a couple of times, is I see class playing a huge role in this. And so if you're of an upper or upper middle class, it's really easy to see pictures on Instagram and like Olivia was saying, sort of, you know, purchase that zero waste starter kit and invest a lot of money up front to be able to, as sort of like a buy-in to be able to participate and be accepted into that community. And so um, seeing that, that if you're not able to do that, it's a hurdle, seeing that as a hurdle and acknowledging that class does play an issue in this movement right now. Right. Thanks. Um, um, Olivia, so could you talk about, you know, what um, organizations which care about representation do, um, you know, so that they could increase the representation um, overall? What organizations who, um, I think um, making their, um, their resources accessible to people of color. So bringing, um, you know, zero, for example, within the zero waste community, bringing zero waste talks and workshops to communities of color, you know, not staying within your neighborhood, but like really expanding out, um, outside of your neighborhood. Um, in addition to, I think it's really important for environmental organizations to host racial justice um, workshops and trainings um, within both like that are um, available for the whole community community to attend, but also for the employees, um, for the people who are hiring administration, administ administration staff, um, and making sure that the racial justice trainings are ongoing. Um, another thing is collaborating with Black Lives Matter and other racial justice um, organizations to see um, what they can do, um, how they can support one another, um, and um, and see if they have any resources they're willing to offer, slash if there's any resources that you can then offer. So like one resource that um, environmental organizations could offer to Black Lives Matter is um, teaching workshops um, for one of their events on zero waste or something like that. Um, and then another thing is making the information relevant. So like, um, uh, for example, like in the zero waste community, they'll talk about like hair care products for zero waste hair care products. Well, those hair uh, care products would never work for my hair. Um, but if you could offer some resources of like zero waste black hair products, that would be great. Um, in addition to a thing, following as many people of color on your um, social media platforms is really important. So like what I do is every, like I'm like constantly looking for POCs um, on social media to follow. And just having them on my newsfeed gets me more familiar and comfortable with, you know, seeing, like making that my norm, seeing people of color involved in sustainability. Um, and if you, um, if you like my social media is filled with I'm following so many people of color so you can use me as a resource for that um, and then also speaking um, about um, denouncing white supremacy and systemic racism um, is so important to do it in a very explicit um, and public way so that way people of color um, can choose to see if you are a safe organization but not just say that but also show that um, I think it's really important um, uh, for not only people of color to see, but also for um, white people to see that you're an organization that denounces white supremacy and you're doing this um, X, Y, and Z. Right. And um, uh, this, uh, when it comes to representation, I mean, uh, this is something that we also see in a developed world and developing world kind of perspective, um, you know, where poverty, uh, people who are actually in poverty, do not get represented uh, much in you know talks about their future. 
Um, and um, so um, I understand, uh, you know, where this is coming from. When, when you know, you're discussing someone's future, I think there should be uh, enough representation from their side, uh, from the actual people who will be impacted by these, you know, climate change and um, other environmental, uh, um, other environmental problems. So, um, Chanel, uh, do you have any um, suggestions on what an organization which cares about representation can do? Uh, real quick, we only have 10 minutes. Um, and and um, so, yeah, please, please go ahead. Sure. Um, yeah, I think one important aspect is how we approach it. So um, thinking about the ideas of charity versus solidarity and understanding how how we begin to engage. And so thinking about solidarity in a way where it's it's aligned, it's supportive, it's there's a little bit of a risk there. Um, so you're willing to sort of take a step down from and decentralize from a place of privilege to in order to really be alongside um, the organization that is is working towards resisting these things and um, creating and supporting a zero waste movement. And so, and then seeing charity as something that's like, oh, okay, well, I can like give some money, but I'm not going to actually be involved all the time or, or something like that, or, or coming to it from an attitude of like fixing something like I'm here to fix this for you. Um, and I think that in solidarity, it's more supportive. You're at, you're listening and you're providing resources, shared resources, and you're alongside um, alongside the other organization. So I think that continuing along those lines of solidarity w amongst each other and um, really supporting communities of color that way is, is really important. Um, and then also from the aspect of representation, um, decentralizing I think is really important as well. So hosting workshops, but also sharing that information so that way the organization can also lead their own workshops and finding a way that maybe um, you find something that's already happening in your city and you can volunteer and support that effort and see what you can do to contribute to help them um, do what they're already doing. So those sorts of things I think are really important. Right. And um, one more question to um, the two of you before, you know, we um, end this session. And um, this is something that um, I've heard from uh, many people. Um, for example, when I'm working on environmental issues and then I talk to someone in a company um, who doesn't deal with environmental issues and then ask them to think about this, the general reaction that I get is, you know, we are so busy, you know, um, we're already doing so many things and we are also working towards certain causes and um, thinking about the environment is, um, you know, it doesn't always happen, you know, because we only have limited time and we have to um, choose what we do with that limited time. I mean, that, that's the kind of response that I generally get. And um, I see something similar um, could be happening. I mean, when I'm working on, on you know, B-Waste Wise or these issues, um, and when I hear about representation, that it might feel um, to me or, you know, other people that, you know, oh, you know, we're already doing this. You know, we don't have, we only have so much time to do all of this. So why should we worry about, um, you know, another problem um, that maybe others are already taking care of? So, uh, I, I mean, it's just choosing between identities, I guess, you know, which one you want to uh, focus more on and which one you want to, you know, build a career on or build a, uh, you know, your, your life on. So, um, I mean, uh, for someone who's, who's um, in, in such a position, um, uh, what's your message? How, how can they um, think about this? And uh, so, yeah, please go ahead. Um, Chanel, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, yes, I think that's hard because this is that's the question that we're asking is is where what is your intention and what are you willing to do to support it? So if your intention, um, you know, on paper is to support diversity and to, you know, to to do these things, then then taking action towards those things is really, really important. Um, I think that we're at a time where just saying it just isn't enough and taking those steps and maybe it feels a little bit risky, but that's that's part of solidarity to me. I think that that, I think that is exactly it. And those are opportunities to really choose, choose what to do and how we're going to do it all together. Olivia? Um, I get, yeah, I get the, that response often, um, just trying to collaborate with local environmental organizations. And I typically respond by asking like, who are you saving the environment for then? Like, why are you saving it? Like, who is it for? Because if it's for people of 
uh, if it's for people, then like you need to support them too. It doesn't have to be either or. And you could see things like white supremacy as being a backdrop to climate change. So just changing your perspective, being more intentional on like who and and asking yourself, who am I saving the environment for? Um, All right. And um, so do you have any um, final um, concluding remarks? You know, we have just five minutes. So we have anything to say to everyone who's watching, you know, what should they remember, what, what they can do and, you know, how they could follow you. You know, I know uh, you guys are only on Instagram and not on Twitter. And that's something uh, Olivia and Carter told me that Instagram is now, you know, really going big. So I'm going to talk to them about that. But, you know, just, just tell us uh, where they can follow you and uh, what they should remember, you know, um, to, uh, thinking about this subject. Chanel or Olivia, either one of you can go first. Um, I guess my biggest thing that I want people to take away is how important it is for everyone to denounce white supremacy and take action to support communities of color, marginalized communities. It, in almost every large issue, marginalized communities are disproportionately affected. And I think it's so important for white people to educate themselves on their oppression, denounce their oppression, um, and also um, provide that education to other white people. Um, and my Instagram is zero waste have a shot H A B E S H A. All right, thanks, Olivia. Chanel. Yes. Um, so my my last thoughts would be to to continue. What the common response I get is that they people just don't know where to start or don't know how to engage. So I think keep asking questions, keep exploring, keep it being engaged. So if you don't know something, ask, reach out. Um, I know that I am happy to facilitate, point you in the right direction. Um, my Instagram is at thinkfeelb, so thinkfeelb all together. That's on Instagram. And um, follow Olivia's Representation Matters series. Share, repost. Um, it's all good. I think um, sharing is uh, one of the first steps towards um, you know, change. So um, we should all, if we like something or uh, if we're learning something from, you know, what you're watching or what we come across, I think we should all share. Um, um, so yeah, if you if you are learning anything from this um, video stream from the session, um, please do that too. And um, just to you know, um, uh, just to um, give support to what uh, Olivia said, I think we would uh, denounce white supremacy. And I think uh, when all of us are working towards uh, improved life on this planet. I think um, uh, dealing with injustice is the first thing that we can do. And uh, white supremacy, uh, based on their notions, I think is a big injustice to um, uh, all people of color. Uh, and uh, not just um, white supremacy, but maybe even brown supremacy. Uh, I, in India, I see a lot of brown supremacy. I mean, uh, they, uh, they think they're you know, the oldest civilization. Therefore, you know, everything will, will do or, you know, they have their own um, um, backward notion. So uh, I would denounce any kind of uh, single community supremacy. Um, so um, let's let's um, maybe end this uh, session there. And then next we have uh, Olivia and Carter Rice joining us. Thank you, Chanel. And thank you, Olivia. Thank you. Thank you.